It was purely by chance. Um, I had sort of joined up with the political struggle back in those days, and as part of that, um, I was part of a group of the founding members of the Namibian newspaper. So every newspaper we kind of figured needed a cartoonist, and nobody there could draw except I had a sort of about the best ability. And that's really how it started. Um, I must have been pretty green in those days, and I didn't have much idea, but at least we could get something out all the time, and it, it kind of developed over the years from there. But political satire was never, I mean, was never my forte by any means. So tell me of how the, because I know you were in the army, and that was a, sort of a, a, a changing point in your life, um, especially with regards to the apartheid state. Can you speak a little bit about that, um, and sort of how that influenced your art? And your well, yeah, as at, during those days, I mean, so that was subscription into the army, something I really didn't want to do. The alternative was five times the amount of time in prison, so I figured I'd just do that year and get it over and done with. But uh, what actually happened with the, um, my time, my year in the army, is that that's what actually politicized me. It made me become completely aware of who my own people were, who you know, those that surrounded me, and what the struggle was all about. It was very, very different to, to what we had been told growing up. So. Being sent to the army, I probably had the most unsuccessful military career of anyone I know. I spent most of my time sort of in, locked up and in trouble in the army. And yeah, not a very successful soldier at all, but it was because I just completely objected to what I saw happening around me. The treatment of people by the very people that, whose side I was on. So that kind of really, you know, it started me thinking and as soon as I'd come out of the army, I'd sort of become completely politicized. Um, and, but the drawing, the cartoons and that only started quite a few years later. Can you tell us a little bit about the war in Amambaland? It, it was a completely fruitless exercise. Um, you know, we were defending South Africa against this communist onslaught, which, you know, was kind of a myth in a lot of, a lot of the minds of the leaders in South Africa. Um, and for me to finally meet these strange communist beasts uh, turned out to be just very ordinary good people. Um, I was really quite surprised and as I said this is what changed it. The time up there was awful, the kind of atrocities being committed by the South African Defence Forces was, was shocking and something that was not easy to live with and I think it, it affected me for many many years uh, after that. Uh, it was just the kind of thing people shouldn't really have to go through. I know a lot of authors have spoken about sort of conflating, at least at that time, the South African government conflating the, the race and communism, as in like the, the, the threat of losing Namibia to the communist was actually that of losing Namibia to the non-apartheid uh, structure. and. Um, I know that's, because I, I, I read a lot about Caprivi because we're going to be going there, and that was sort of the, the, the usefulness of Caprivi was to keep an eye on the neighbors for either keeping South Africa as this bastion of anti-communism, but also sort of keeping it as a bastion of, of white values. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, very much so. I mean, Namibia was, <clears throat> was a buffer zone, you know, in, in, to a large degree. There's nothing much they could do about Zimbabwe and Zambia and Botswana for that matter. Botswana wasn't really a threat. <clears throat> but um, the biggest sort of threat was coming from Angola and sort of that side of Africa and maybe down the east coast of Tanzania. Um, so this was just a massive buffer zone. Um, and yes, it was. It was to try and keep the sort of white ideals you know, going. Um, such an archaic idea and how they ever thought they'd succeed in that, I don't know. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about SWAPO at that time? What was your opinion of SWAPO? Do you, did you see them as a, a pragmatic means to an end? At that stage, I saw it as the only means to an end. Um, you know, they were sort of fairly closely aligned to the ANC, but um, the, the African National Congress from South Africa. 
But uh, the only way we were going to get rid of apartheid in this country was by um, was through SWAPO. Uh, there was no one else who, who could sort of do that for us. So that is certainly why I immediately, you know, jo join up with SWAPO. Um, I didn't have a, a very deep knowledge at the time of who they were and what kind of an organisation, but they did embrace all Namibians in the fight against apartheid. So for me, that was good enough. I was going to, I was prepared to go along with them. Okay, and I want to bring up your your, your poster work, which I know about that thing all the time, <laughs> because this 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 piece I found very interesting. Um, not only the way, can you go a little bit into the way the posters were made, as well as how they were reproduced and distributed through some of uh, yeah, you can you can hold the book up if you like, but um, sort of how they were made, as well as. Uh, distributed to the public in such a way that they evoked this um, nationalist sentiment? Yeah, I mean, the posters, a lot of the time, were being made, um, well, I don't think the Namibian newspaper would have been particularly happy at the time, trying to be an independent paper, but I would use their facilities, bromide cameras and things like that, their light desks and everything, all these kind of things I didn't personally have. So a lot of those were just sort of really, it was a mixture of the cartoons, it was a mixture of photographs. Whatever sentiment was going, and I mean, once again, I hadn't had much experience or training in, in design or anything. And it was just something you knew what would get to the people. And we had to mobilize the people. It was as simple as that. So posters were just made willy-nilly, you know, sort of whatever way we could do it. We had a, a press, a, a wonderful Italian press for T-shirts. Um, stored in my, my garage, which people would never ever you know, have considered looking there at the time. They were searching for this thing, knowing of its existence. And we, of course, right through, burn the midnight oil, we'd go right through the night and we'd print posters, we'd print t-shirts and things like that. The quality wasn't very good, but the message was there. And of course, for the people to see a t-shirt like that, when, when virtually everything that was Swapo was banned, uh, for people to see that, it really lifted a lot of people's spirits. So that was fantastic for us, you know. Um, you, of course, you felt, you know, you knew you were doing wrong and you knew you could get punished for what you were doing, but, well, that was it. With the struggle, the battle lines had been drawn and that was it. Can you speak of a little bit, um, well, I know we cover it a bit in the Namibian at 25, the, um, the bombing of the Namibian offices. When we were at the, the, the offices, they actually kept a little portion of the wall framed to, um, to sort of commemorate that. I'll see if I can, there's, the, there's a picture in here. Give me just one moment. Because that's, I know, and it also happened more than once, if, if my memory is that's right. correct. Yeah, that's, that was at the, once the, um, that was the new office where, which was bombed. The old offices were bombed as well. And we probably thought it was a good idea to get out of there. The, the firm of architects that had kindly let us rent the premises were obviously not very happy. It was an old, lovely building. And since we had moved in there, things had turned to chaos and the place was getting bombed and everything. I lost a lot of my, my cartoons, for example. I used to store them all at the office. And of course, with these phosphorus bombs and everything, I, I lost a lot of my work, but um, well, once again, that was part for the course. Now, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Can you explain your relationship with Gwen and the founding of the newspaper a little more in depth? Before I'd ever come to Namibia, um, my parents were living here. And when they'd return back to South Africa, where I was living at the time, they'd bring newspapers, which were kind of different from the newspapers we had in South Africa. They were a lot more liberal. You could get away with a lot more. and the person who particularly stood out for me was Gwen Lister. She was a columnist for this newspaper. And I was just amazed that someone who looked the way she did, this diminutive woman who had the guts to sort of just let out and talk like that. I mean, I just thought that was fantastic. So I became a very avid reader of her column. And, you know, I'd get my parents to send it to me every month uh, whenever they could. So that's basically how it started. So obviously when I arrived in Namibia, this was somebody I would, I would really like to meet. And as it was, we bumped into each other, music being a sort of a common denominator there. And yeah, that's how it kind of started. That's how the friendship started. And the immediate response of the government to the newspaper? 
was shocking. Um, you know, they were, they were outraged. They couldn't believe that we'd actually try and pull a stunt like that. They did everything to try and get it banned, to try and stop it from being printed. First edition, walking out on the streets with a red t-shirt, which of course we had been branded commies, so figured that may as well go the whole hog. And I walked out and sold newspapers as a, as a vendor and for the very first edition. And we had people spitting at us in the streets and shouting, you know, abuse at us and everything. But on the other hand, you had a lot of people who were very curious. And of course, a lot of excited people buying this newspaper. It was cheaper than all the others. And suddenly it was for the first time in this country, there was the, the voice of the people had arrived. So yeah, it was a very mixed reaction, but uh, very interesting. Well, you know, I think just very simply put, a decision was taken by Gwen at the time that this is going to be an independent newspaper. And she didn't encourage members of the staff, for example, to become card-carrying members of, the, of SWAPO. Um, of course, she wouldn't you know, tell them she wasn't allowed to, or they weren't allowed to, or anything like that. But um, she decided that the only way uh, for, for us to have any kind of credibility as a newspaper was to um, remain completely independent. And, and that's what she had done. And I know that when the, the struggle was over and independence had come, the first thing the government wanted was her to obviously head up a government newspaper, believing that's what, Swap, uh, what the Namibian always had been. Um, and you know, to her credit, you know, she turned around and simply told them that wasn't the case, that whilst their principles um, and what they were trying to achieve were, was, may have been similar. Um, she couldn't now suddenly just throw herself headlong in and become a, a government mouthpiece. So, you know, in, what he says there is, is actually very true. The Namibian has tried to maintain a lot of those sort of standards and things, which, are, which I think is great. And, and it's one of the only newspapers in this country that has been able to. And I think over time, the credibility of the newspaper has, has proven itself making it the biggest newspaper by far in the country today. And uh, now about your cartoons, because you began, um, there was one printed that was essentially saying uh, uh, like a uh, resisting the army and, and whatnot during apartheid times. And it moved to where Swapo comes under fire as well, or decisions made by Swapo. I know there was the thing with the railroad, and um, and oh, there, there are dozens, but is this because Swapo has changed, or because Swapo was not the end, but merely sort of a means to an end? It's a combination of both. Swapo were not the end, um, and also they changed a, a lot. When they returned, um, we, a lot of us, firmly believed that we would now see all the policies that they had spoken about for years and years prior to independence. Um, those were never implemented. None of that really happened. The poor stayed poor, the rich got richer, nothing really changed. We changed our flag, we changed our name, we changed a few things, but nothing else really changed. So, so yes, um, and I, I believed at the time that my role as a political satirist was simply to whoever was in power, if they were screwing up, then you know, we, we hammer them. And I very quickly realized, and I gave, I gave them a grace period of a few years in which I decided I wouldn't really do cartoons. It was, it was a difficult thing for me to do. The very people I'd been defending and supporting all these years um, were now screwing up a bit and, you know, it was a bit awkward to, to have a go at them. But I very quickly realized that, you know, that in, in keeping with the policies of the paper, that's what we needed to do. Um, by then, of course, I had gone into film and other sort of areas and I didn't really have that much time for the, the paper, but I, I began to realize that it is, it's as an important um, little niche in the paper. People enjoyed the cartoon. It was necessary. And I found myself becoming increasingly, um, I, I wouldn't say demoralized, but there were so many things happening in the country I was, I was really unhappy with. And I needed to vent my frustration as well. So to be able to do that in a small little piece, I could just do a cartoon every week and feel a little bit better. <laughs> and, okay. And how do you determine who gets it each week? You know, it's as simple as you just, you know, you pick up the paper. I only do the cartoons on a Friday, so you know, I'll read Monday to Wednesday to th Thursday. And, you know, whoever, there's so much. Um, 
information. I mean, so much material for a cartoon usually that, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to find one. And then you just sort of, you know, it's the bigger guys. You usually go for them and the sort of the, the more public figures. And as I say, there's, there's always a lot of material for a cartoon. Okay. And now I want to I wanna bring up I want to bring up some of the topics which, which your cartoons have um, covered a little bit and um, major developments that are being reported by the Namibian and whatnot and sort of get the ta take of a political satirist on this. You write, you, you, you know, you didn't write, you drew a lot about the, the, the Sumeb Railway to go up to the north. Tell us a little bit about, um, about that as well as um, the impetus that, that, that caused you to draw about it? Um, you know, I don't know, the railways, I didn't really do that many on them. You know, as a matter of fact, the very first ones were um, quite supportive in a way of the president. You know. I always believed a very good idea to have a railway line uh, to the north. You know, that was something that was clearly missing in the old years. And the first cartoons was done about Nyoma, the the father of the nation, the ex-president. Um, and we, we kind of supported the man, you know, getting his sort of rolling up his sleeves, taking off his jacket and getting down with a pick and a shovel and, and you know, doing his little bit there as well. So we, we kind of supported him on that. And it's not as though we were just trying to attack the government any time, you know, there was. We, if they did something good, we'd support them. Unfortunately, they, that wasn't to be too often. Um, but it was the cost and it was the way, it, the, the, the slovenly way in which they went about. Um, the, the gauge, for example, of the tracks uh, had been designed for the Chinese and not for this country. They were two different sizes. All this money, all the, as I say, very sloppy way of going about everything. It was costing the taxpayers millions. So, you know, I think wherever taxpayers are being hit really heavily, then, then you want to sort of get in and, and do something. But uh, there weren't too many of them. And as I say, just Sometimes you just couldn't resist because of the glaring mistakes which being made with that railroad. And also, um, you had mentioned earlier that sort of how the costs would escalate the further north you went. And I mean, this is something which upsets a lot of people. And we're not here just for one particular group in this country. Everyone should benefit. And that hasn't really been the case. Um, you're probably aware of how many groups there are in Namibia. It's, it's incredible. So. You know, so why one group above the other the whole time? And, you know, we'd like to see the benefits go to be spread a bit further. I hunted around, but I couldn't find any, any, any of your cartoons about it. But it could be that I'm just not very good at finding Did you do anything on Northland City? On? Northland City. You know that big project that... that um, oh... There was, yes, there was one that I had done. But, I, you know, I can't even remember it. So many of these cartoons comics I've been doing it for so long I can't even remember all of them. There was something we had done because that was just another scam. It was quite a few years ago but that was oh, just an absolute scam. What are what was probably your most memorable one? Either the one that you personally thought was the best or one that received sort of some of the best responses from the public? You know funny enough um, my favorite subject was always the one of the former South African leaders, P.W. Boerter. I used to really, you know, enjoy having a go at him. But probably the most memorable was um, there were a group of actually policemen working as soldiers in, in the north of this country. And they would be called Makakunya, which um, literally meant bloodsucker. And um, they belonged to an organization called Kufut. So we'd go for a, a character that looked really, really scary with bloodshot eyes and this kind of character that would come in the night. And of course, everybody in northern Namibia lived in fear of, of Kufut, which literally means, well, that means crowbar. Um, and they were a pretty evil bunch of people. So instead of just singling out their leader or something, we just depict them, this very monstrous character. And strangely enough, those probably, that became the most memorable figure that I'd ever done. Yeah, yeah, would be. Next. The corrupt leaders. Yeah, I think that's what we've got to start looking at. The cronyism that's carrying on in this country. 
the corruption, which I'm sure everywhere you've gone in this place, you've heard a lot about it. But it is, it's, it's, it's tragic to see what's going on. I'm not saying we're the only country in Africa by any means. It's happening to and our neighbors down south. That is frightening as well, the, the level of corruption. But I just don't see why they should be allowed to be getting away with it. It is so blatant. You've got guys who finally have ended up in prison, but these guys who believe that um, if they got caught um, with all these things that they were doing, the government would support them. I am a SWAPA member. This is the sort of whole thing of entitlement in this country, that nothing can happen to us. We're untouchable. And so th that should be my main target. You know, anybody who's corrupt, and believe me, it's hard to find a politician these days who's not corrupt. Thank you so much for meeting with us, sir. Hey, good. Now, <laughs> no what questions do you have?